Hello, tell me who you are and what do you do? Kia ora koutou, uh, ko tēlau ho. Um, my name is Taylor Davies Koi. I am an environmental educator and just general real passionate about trees. Um, I'm an awesome ambassador for Trees at Count and a member of the Otago Conservation Board. A tēnā rā koutou katoa, ko mi kaire tōku ingoa. I am a taonga pūro student, very young in that space, but really passionate about the ngāhere and day-to-day I work at MPI. Thanks, guys. Uh, you seem really pumped about bringing these two worlds together of mataranga Māori and uh, a Western science worldview. Uh, can you expand on that? Explain why that makes so much sense to you. I think if we really look at forests and we really look at what's best for them, I think we stumble upon the way that mataranga Māori is represented in those spaces naturally. You know, we look at the best times to plant rako. We look at the way that we uh, can live with our forests instead of living separate to them. And I suppose we are kind of naturally converging towards realising that mataranga Māori is, is the primary principle in those spaces anyway. We often get really caught up with thinking that it's separate to Western science or that it's uh, like butting heads with. And I think that's just because of a lack of understanding, you know, and a classic, the, the classic example of that is something like Mahingakai, thinking about the harvesting, cultural harvesting of, of you know, things like manu, birds from the forest. But the, the point at which, you know, we can harvest kereru from the forest is the point that there's so many kereru that you can harvest them. So the, the pathway to those points are exactly the same, you know, both are protecting kereru, both are ensuring robust ecosystems. But then there's just another aspect of that, which in, is that cultural engagement that, you know, is what we want. My iwi, Ngātiki and Ngāti Tūra, we were known for our weaving, always have been, but because of the rampant loss of both connection and just the physical loss of all our different manu, our weavers who have passed down these techniques for literally thousands of years, yeah, now have to go to a $2 shop and hope that there's feather dusters there because that is the only way they can get feathers. Whereas as Taylor was saying, that goal of getting back to a space where not only are there manu back in our forests, but we have the ability and the permission to work with them. And it is a really hard thing to work with because when you're weaving, it's not just the thing you're weaving, it's all that corded or all of that whakapapa going into it. And for that to then be as a chicken versus as a kiwi or as a toroa or as a kaka, we've lost that connection with it while still trying to keep alive the culture through what we can do. Can you foresee a time when the worlds of commerce and conservation merge together so there's no real difference between the two? I, I, I think like we'll either see it merging or we won't exist. You know, I feel like the, the answer to our, to our social issues, to our climate issues, to our environmental issues, which are all just one big issue really, is that, you know, integration of us and nature. Bringing those, that nature into our, what we would describe as human or economic spaces like farms or whatever, uh, bringing ourselves out to what we would consider natural spaces. And I think without that integration, we're never going to achieve our goals around climate mitigation or social well-being or general, you know, health as well, because connection with the environment is so important to people's well-being generally. What gets you angry? What do you really want to knock down? If I keep going down that weaving path in order to get a cultural access permit, I know some of my aunties who've been waiting for the call from Doc for literally three years. And for those three years that they've sat on, they've received requests to weave kete or kākahu for people to embody their culture. But if they do that, they're committing a crime, which can be a $100,000 fine or potentially prison time. They're not doing it to poach the bird and make a massive profit because there isn't a lot of profit in our traditional arts, but it's that embodiment of culture and that using the natural resources to their full extent instead of just pulling out three feathers and biffing it in the bin, you know? And yeah, I think it is that looking at a reform of some pieces of legislation that really have held us back from being able to embody that. I'm interested to know more about how you use TikTok to engage young people in this conversation. It's a really cool space to engage with people, to kind of, you know, bring, bring some of that knowledge that I've been really lucky enough to be facilitated to have and spread some fizz for our native wildlife. And, and again, with that kind of underlying thing of telling people the stuff exists and that the stuff is out there and that they can go and engage with it and find it and, and love it as well. Yeah. 
Yes, I remember a quote or someone shared with me where they said, Ma Tauranga is not Ma Tauranga unless it's shared. As I learn and as Taylor learns, you bring people along on that journey. And I think for me, it's the demystification as well. It's just making it relevant so our young people want to pick it up. Like I know Horomono Horo, one of the um, exponents of Taonga Puro, he, he plays a lot of Biggie Smalls, a lot of Nelly, like a lot of melodies from that using our traditional instruments to keep them relevant. We talk about rimu, we talk about tōtara, we talk about these beautiful trees. But if kids can see a tangible thing made out of that and see the colour and see the beauty of it and hold it and feel it and smell it and then hear it, that develops that connection. And I think that's the opportunity there.